Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. We're back. How goes the hour? Um, the NAACP Maryland State Conference. This is Willie Flowers talking to you. Um, as always, we want to start with our, our monologue that we can call a money log this week, million, million dollar money log, because um, we're looking at these uh, issues, not just in the United States, we're looking at them internationally because it just popped up on the wire that the United States government seized or gave back $23 million to Nigeria um, uh, under the regime of uh, President Abacha. Apparently they, they itemized that he took like $5 billion and just threw it around the world. Now, if you have been paying attention to this during the nineties or whenever he, he, he was in leadership, I think from 93 to 97, um, we know that instead of building an infrastructure for his country, he basically made deals with American countries or countries around the world to do oil for them. Um, Shell was one of those companies, um, um, uh, BP and others. And instead of, like I said, creating the infrastructure for himself, building companies for himself, he just gave them the raw oil and took the money. And he was putting money throughout the world, you know, not just in America and um, England, France, wherever he could, Sweden, any way he could drop money. And they estimate that he, um, you know, uh, banked like $5 billion for him and his family. Now, one of those family members ended up in New Jersey and he had, th I think, $370 million somewhere, just like his dad, his son. Um, now, the irony in all this, while he was banking this money everywhere and they say that he looted this money from his country, which he did, um, but he did it personally. I'm sure he had people working with him. The thing is, they only gave the country $23 million back, you know, and so the millions are uh, uh, interesting play on words. The term looting is an interesting play because the United States government clearly um, looted something if they, um, I guess, found Three hundred million and gave the country back twenty three million, and that's not to to talk about the five billion they itemized. So it's an interesting thing. This brother is dead. Um, the country is still in shambles. And the other piece I must highlight: the United States government says if we're going to give you the money back, you have to use it for public um, public works projects. So to build infrastructure for, I guess, the United States government to go in and um, get more oil. So that's one highlight internationally. Now in the nation, I um, I guess everybody knows about Newman's Own. Newman's Own is a, a, a company started by Paul Newman when he was alive. In this country, he basically started out making uh, uh, salad dressing. And the salad dressing blew up because his name was on it. And a few years before he died, he decided to create a foundation. The foundation is called um, Newman's Foundation, I think. And the foundation, since he has died, has kind of changed a little. I'm sure things change, leadership change. But the principle of the foundation was to give money to children in need. And that has changed a little. So his daughters are suing the foundation for that money. Um, they were given 400000 apiece um, each year. The plan was the foundation reduced that amount. And so they're suing for $1.9 million, I think. And I, I wish him luck with that. Um, I was inspired when I first saw Newman's own salad dressing myself, and I actually buy it because of his name and the fact that he had the foundation. So I encourage everybody to take a look at that um, until that's settled um, in the NAACP. We don't like to say the B word, but I will say that we should divest until they get it settled because the idea of a, a celebrity to give uh, a create a structure to give money back to the community is a, a, a very exciting thing. I would support that. It's like we support other um, uh, other products that give back to the community. And I think this was a worthwhile thing to uh, uh, monitor. So until it's done right. So look out for Newman's own until it's uh, rectified. Now the final thing coming down closer to, not closer, closer to home for me because I'm from the state of Alabama. Turns out that uh, one of my favorite coaches of all time, Nick Saban, got a very large, uh, handsome raise. Uh, he's, a, he's a coach of the Alabama, uh, University of Alabama 
a roll tide football team. He's always been a high paid, high powered, um, but a winning coach, high, highly paid, well respected, everything you can think of. He's had this, he's been the coach of this team for, I guess, 15, 17 years, something, and um, has been to every championship, has won more championships than anybody. And he's always been the highest paid um, coach in uh, NCAA history. It turns out that um, the University of Alabama lost a game against Georgia, one of his former um, assistants named Kirby Smart of Georgia, beat him in the National Football um, Championship. When Kirby Smart did that, Kirby Smart got a raise that was more than Nick Saban's raise. Nick Saban and Kirby Smart share the same agent who negotiates their, um, their contracts with the universities they work for. So this same agent, after um, giving Kirby Smart a raise at Georgia, went back to University of Alabama and said, Nick Saban needs a raise too. So Nick Saban is now making $11.7 million a year until pretty much the day he dies. The problem with this is the, uni the University of Alabama is one thing. The Alabama football thing is another thing. The fact is that the, uni that the state of Alabama is in such a state, to my dismay, um, that it needs more than uh, the news of 11 million, uh, 10 million or $11 million of a, for a coach, or it needs more than being excited about a football game. Um, in 2020, it was reported that the state of Alabama, uh, after the COVID period, had more people to die than who were born in that state. It was painful for me to hear then. It's painful for me to know that it that nothing has changed since then. And it's even more painful to hear that a football coach is making $11.7 million. Um, it's something to look at as it pertains to where we put our priorities. But while I like football, I even love Nick Saban. I think that the priorities in that state are way off. And again, the University of Alabama is, is different than the state. The state is differently than um, the football team. But our focus needs to be on building people up, uplifting communities, and helping people when they're down. And because you can't help them when they're dead. So that's my monologue for today. Um, we're getting into a show today. I'm excited to have um, someone I've known for some years, someone I heard about long before I met him. Um, he was like a rising star on the Baltimore City Council. He can correct me in the mid uh, 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 90s. 90s, mid 90s, 1995, when I first got elected. And um, he was a rising star then. Um, what I didn't know, because I wasn't from uh, Maryland or Baltimore City, what I didn't know that his his family legacy uh, went way farther back to 1995. And uh, not only is his family legacy connected to Baltimore City and the state of Maryland, it's also uh, significantly entwined with the history of the NAACP, not just in Baltimore City, not just in Maryland, but in the entire country. Because at the time that his great-grandmother, Lily Carroll Jackson, um, led the NAACP, um, the entire country was looking at what was happening in Baltimore City to be motivated by her work and her diligence um, in the branch pretty much until the day she died. So I want to introduce everybody, go ahead and say, present to some, introduce to others, um, council member, former council member, count, former delegate, um, and former chief of staff for the governor, um, Kiefer Jackson Mitchell. How you doing, um, Brother Mitchell? Good afternoon, Mr. Flowers. It's great to be here. It's always good to see you, and it's always good to be part of the uh, NAACP and uh, going back, you mentioned members of my family and everything like that. So I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Well, the um, discussion starts with you, man. I um, First of all, I'm very um, proud. We can get into it, but I'm very proud that um, in all things that you have always been, because I'm not from Maryland, I want to emphasize that. And um, when And I've done campaigns, I've done political work, I've done something in areas and the thing that you remember when you're, particularly when you're considered an outsider, you know how Baltimore is, 
you remember the people who um, didn't treat you like an outsider. And I want to uh, applaud you and your family. I mean, I can I, every member of your family has been consistent with, um, um, you know, kind of a warm welcome to me, even though you're entrenched. Because <laughs> when we talk about this stuff with your grandmother, you're entrenched. So if anybody could say, like, you don't belong around here, you could have legitimately have said that. And after I found the history, I was like, oh, that's why you said that. But but the point is, not just you, your father, your father, who is who is my physician, um, your um, your um, your your cousin, C4, uh, regardless of uh, C4 and his uh, new experience on the other side, <laughs> um, uh, your uncle, uh, Michael Mitchell. I mean, the uh, entire family um, has always been very warm, very, um, you know, stewards of, um, of Baltimore City. And I think that um, people forget about that um, when they, you know, kind of hold on to something. The reality is that uh, Baltimore City and Maryland, for that matter, is something that you should share. If if um, if you know the history of it, you want people to um, not only be brought in so they can understand the rich history of, of, of Maryland, but you want them to contribute to it and preserve it. So I want to applaud you and your family for every experience I've had it has been very positive. Um, and, you know, um, the, the one thing I, I know about um, your uncle Michael Mitchell is that anytime I want to talk about civil rights, he knows not only was he he knows about it, he was there. You know what I'm saying? He, 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 so, he was there uh, and he has all the archives. He's not only that, he knows every civil rights song there is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I met a young lady once who um, told me she went on a cross country trip with him and his, his daughter and her and said he sang every civil rights song every stop they made <laughs> and he knows he basically knows the methodist hymnal exactly <laughs> so uh and that's let's let's start there because well, i'll be remiss before i start you know how you, you and i met years ago was through your lovely wife kim who in my opinion was one of the was the best rex and parks director for baltimore thank you, City. Thank you. Uh, and and she is sorely missed in the city. Her, yeah, she, was you, she was young, talented, and then uh, you had to come in and sweep her out. And <laughs> you know well, that's what happened with the down. That was the downfall of Baltimore City Rec and Parks after uh, you came man, into the don't picture. Say that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, I, I, I drive by Druid Hill Park every day, and I see something beautiful about to happen. So uh, it takes <laughs> that kind of um, uh, construction and development to make something. Um, plant something beautiful. I think it's going to be awesome. Whatever they're doing there, it's taking a while, but it's going to be awesome. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but um, you mentioned the United Methodists. Now, from my notes, your grandmother, and this is um, uh, Dr. Lily, she got a lot of names. She was born into a Methodist family, correct? Correct. She, uh, she was born right in uh, what is now Seton Hill right off of uh, Druid Hill Avenue. I believe it was like St. Mary Street uh, where she was born. And uh, when she was born, she had several sisters and, and brothers. Uh, in fact, two of her sisters or two of her siblings uh, died of, uh, of the fever way back then of the Carols. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned uh, her work in the NAACP, you know, we, we got to go back to in terms of the courage that it took for her and others to be members of the NAACP. She was a leader in NAACP for over 35 years at a time when it was not popular or sort of dangerous, particularly for African-American women to lead organizations like that. And we're talking in the 30s and 40s when African-American women or women for all that matter, we're supposed to stay home, cook, clean, and raise children. Uh, but she organized uh, the Baltimore City branch and also the Maryland branch uh, and did a phenomenal job in terms of uh, putting on the for putting in the forefront all of the uh, things that needed to be done to bring equality and civil rights, not just to the state, but also to the country. Now, the um, significance of that, because that takes uh, confidence, courage, it takes some sense that, um, 
you know, I might die, but it's going to be worth it. Um, you, you, we discussed earlier that her lineage comes from the first Carols well, in, this, in this state. Correct? It goes all the way back. I don't have the, I, I can't remember the exact lineage or, or the line, uh, the line of order, but she is a descendant of Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Uh, that's when we wanted the signers of the Declaration of Independence, uh, who had a plantation on Dorgan Manor uh, in Montgomery County. And as a kid, uh, my grandmother, Juanita Mitchell, would drive us out there just to see where uh, this plantation was for Charles Carroll Carrollton and say that our roots sort of started right there uh, on my great grandmother, Dr. Lily uh, Carol Jackson's uh, side of the family. That's amazing, and it's and it's and what what I, the reason I bring that up is that to understand where you literally come from gives you confidence to do these types of things. You know, so she comes from a you know you mentioned earlier that it wasn't common for women to do that, but to have that as your backup plan, <laughs> you know. It right. seems that she, she was, you know, had the confidence that required to not just um, organize, but also to, you know, organize other people to see the value of her input. Right. And she was organizing protests and picket lines in the 40s. You know, you go back to here in Baltimore, uh, the buy where you can work campaign. Uh, and essentially she organized uh, the NAACP to protest uh, these shops and grocery stores where if you couldn't work there as an African-American, you shouldn't be putting your money in there to buy their products. Uh, and they had these protests that was very effective where the stores started to open up to African-Americans because you know the power of the purse in terms of economics for these stores, they realize you know, the African-American community collectively has uh, a lot of power uh, as, it re as it comes to economics in terms of putting their money uh, in certain areas uh, of the economy. And uh, that was a very effective protest that she had uh, back then that really got her name out there, organizing the churches and things like that uh, to get folks to start picketing and boycotting it. So, and this was before the Montgomery bus boycott or anything like that, that you read in the history books, this was a protest that was very effective that dealt with the economics of Baltimore and, and of the business community. Right. And, and I think that um, that's kind of um, where you had to hit them, right? Because if you start taking that money, influencing money, uh, whether you're being conservative with your money or you're um, are blocking somebody else's, that's when people start listening to you. And um, it's, it's very significant to me that she did that as a first step, as opposed to, you know, the marches and all that kind of stuff, because every tactic has its purpose. But um, if you hit them in the pocket, you know, you know, people are going to start squealing. Right. So, and um, she was she was a very shrewd businesswoman. You know, people she she believed in owning property. Uh, that was. Uh, what she was known for. So, you know, back then you go to these auctions uh, as an African-American, you couldn't buy real estate uh, in certain neighborhoods. So what she would do, she befriended some white folks uh, who were business folks that she would give them the money and they would go and bid on the properties on her behalf. And so she was able to amass uh, these uh, properties throughout uh, Baltimore, particularly West Baltimore. And that's how she sustained raising her family. Uh, and that is, you know, providing rental uh, units to folks uh, and collecting the rent. And that was the income. And that is how she was able to put all four of her children through college. Um, and, and what she did, she did not believe uh, in uh, go, her children going to a segregated school. Uh, so all four of her children went out of state uh, for college. My grandmother, for instance, went to the University of Pennsylvania um, and graduated at a very young age. She went, but my great grandmother 
Dr. Jackson believed in a first class uh, education. She felt that if you were in a segregated school, you know, the states or the government would have subpar materials uh, in these segregated schools. So she didn't think it was it was sort of a second class education that folks were getting. Uh, but she said she would believe that you get a first class education. And that's what she was fighting for. to Make sure her children at the top education to come back to make sure that all of our schools were opened up uh, for people of all colors and all races to have a first class education. Now, I want you bring that up. And I've, I've heard this before. And I don't know if uh, your grandmother and others were beneficiaries of it. But I understand that in the state of Maryland, um, to avoid sending people to to University of African Americans to University of Maryland, that the state would pay for them to go to colleges outside of, of state. Were they beneficiaries of that policy? They weren't. They, they, they weren't beneficiaries of that. My grandmother didn't believe in that at all. Uh, you know, the, the example that you bring up that I want to bring up with that issue is Thurgood Marshall. You know, Thurgood Marshall was trying to integrate the University of Maryland Law School. And uh, they said, or actually not, uh, it was Marshall that led the case, but it was Donald Gaines Murray, uh, the first African-American to gain admittance to the um, University of Maryland Law School. At that time was the only law school uh, in the state. But they said that, well, we don't have a law school for African-Americans. Princess Anne Academy back then was the other uh, traditionally African-American school. They didn't have a law school. So the state had offered to pay, actually the governor had actually offered to pay through the state for Donald Gaines Murray to go to a, uh, a law school out of the state. And that's where you have the Donald Gaines Murray case um, that Thurgood Marshall and NAACP Legal Defense Fund came in and argued and won to allow Donald Gaines Murray to become the first African-American to attend University of Maryland Law School. And that's an interesting perspective, too, because um, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall couldn't get in, so he, he goes to, to uh, Howard and meets uh, Charles Hamilton Houston. And so exactly. the question is, would we have had um, Third good Marshall had he gone to Maryland. So it's right. kind of a blessing for the world. Exactly. <laughs> the, the list of ironies about what, the way we do this, and you have to accept it in the civil rights movement that maybe God wanted it that way. So, exactly, exactly. Uh, now, um, so there's there's uh, Dr. Lily Carroll Jackson, and the, the name Jackson comes from Mississippi, correct? Correct, that was my great grandfather who uh, you know, my father and I are, are named for his, his name was Kiefer Albert Jackson. He uh, was from Carrollton, Mississippi. Uh, Ironically. Exactly. Coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> he was from Carrollton, Mississippi. Uh, and he, he, how he earned his money was through the motion picture. He believed that he, he would go around the country to film uh, back then uh, all the great works that African-Americans were doing uh, in terms of business and recreation and in the social scenes. Uh, but he would go around and film them and then he would travel around the country and go to, into the churches to show African-Americans that, you know, this is what's happening around the country. This is the success that African-Americans were doing. So he was very successful in his motion pictures. Uh, and he met my great grandmother, uh, Lily, uh, while she was singing uh, in the church at Sharp Street United Methodist Church. She was singing in the church. And uh, he, the story is that he fell in love with her voice and then said that he wanted to uh, get to know her and marry her. And so they had this long courtship and they were married. Uh, and when I talk about the properties that my great grandmother had, you know, he still did the motion pictures, but he was also sort of like the uh, superintendent of the properties. He would go around and fix them up, fix the roofs, uh, fix windows and things like that. So he was sort of super of the property. So it was a it was a dynamic, uh, a really fascinating uh, partnership that they had. Um, and, you know, he, he was very uh, he was fair 
his skin was very fair. He could easily pass as a white person, um, and, but he always identified himself as African American. And, uh, and and sometimes people within the NAACP would ask my great grandmother, "Why why are you bringing this white man to the?" meetings and everything and stuff like that so so, so the uh, i guess at the core of this um and it's a uh, sense this uh consistent with independence is that they didn't have to worry about what you know where their money was coming from because they had their own right um, they just uh, they they knew they still they believed in the fact that you know you you get an education and you make something of yourself but you know, they believe not just in civil rights, but they also believe in economics uh, and that, you know, when you control you with the economics and the education, you control your own destiny. Uh, and that's what they thoroughly believe in. Now, at the same time, all of this was going on and I, I kind of detailed that the foundation, I just knew about the foundation of the, the Maryland State Conference that she founded um, was in 1946, which is uh, interesting time for that because that's after World War II and that's yep. where it jumped off. Um, and now in all of my notes, and I've had to look at them from uh, Howard County uh, and other places, is that um, it wasn't, um, it was her or your grandmother who started founding branches in the state. It was, uh, it was my great grandmother that started doing the the foundation of going to the counties and starting the foundation of the branches. But my grandmother, her daughter, uh, who is Juanita Mitchell, uh, you know, started going around organizing uh, in these branches uh, around the state. Uh, and she was a, a lawyer, a constitutional civil rights lawyer. Uh, so she was sort of like the counsel uh, of uh, of the NAACP. Um, there are some letters that uh, I think my uncle Michael has between my great grandmother and my grandmother and Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston, all talking about how they were trying to organize these branches, not just in Maryland, but around uh, the country. It's really fascinating in terms of, you know, the, the lawyers like Thurgood Marshall and and Charles Hamilton Houston, you know, sending letters or invoices to the Maryland branch saying, hey, you owe us some money for, you know, this uh, this branch and that branch. You are late uh, on this payment and everything like that. But it, it's fascinating in terms of the, the buildup of the NAACP. Uh, and, you know, you, Willie, being the head of the NAACP, you know, of Maryland, this is the historic NAACP branch. Uh, the Maryland branch, because that's where all the other branches around the country sort of looked at Maryland as sort of the model uh, of how to organize and, and get things done. And that's beautiful. Now, um, we move up into, um, so simultaneously, while all this is going on, you have the sideline of the Afro-American newspaper that is kind of voice of the um, the country, the black world that preceded uh, Ebony and Jet, as we know, um, and all these people are in one space. So that's 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 amazing to me. And even before that, we have to mention that um, the precursor of the AME Church itself was also um, Bethel Church, which right. is significant. Um, and then you have um, uh, you mentioned earlier St. Francis, uh, uh, Seton Hill. Uh, that was a neighborhood uh, we lived in when we were here. And it's the first time, you know, the first election I participated in, I voted for you. Um, <laughs> the um, the reason I bring that up is, and then uh, Seton Hill was the where St. Mary's uh, Seminary was. They moved it out. You know, they say they left the, um, <laughs> and they <laughs> left the, uh, <laughs> the bodies because it was a cemetery there. And um, and it could be true because you might not know this, but a lot of the the neighbors along um, Packer Street had headstones of the um, of the from the funeral home in their basements. You know, they made up the marble <laughs> in their basement. You might not know about that. I didn't know about that one. <laughs> yeah, I was, it was weird to me. I was like, "Are you serious?" But the point <laughs> is, um, 
a lot of people don't know that the a nucleus of the uh, Black Catholic movement in America started, I'm not going to say it started there, but it was impacted there by uh, Mother Mary Lang because um, she, her first home was on George Street. They founded the uh, Oblate Society in St. Mary's uh, Church, which is on that campus. And then she founded St. Francis Academy, which still exists today, which exactly. is significant. Um, to the world, not just the United States of uh, Maryland, is significant to the world because it's one of the longest serving black educational institutions in the world. Um, right. And all, all this is in Baltimore. And this is why um, I get excited about it. I certainly get excited about these talks about history, but I do think we neglect all the power that was going on during those times. And, um, and, and, and you know, th these movements about structuring around civil rights kind of kept it in place and gave people their power. Exactly. You, you mentioned Bethel AME Church. Uh, you also have to mention uh, Sharp Street, United Sharp Street. Methodist Church. Sharp mm -hmm. Street, you know, in the, ba in the basement of Sharp Street, uh, the history is, is that what, what started in that basement of Sharp Street, United Methodist Church was Morgan State College. Which is now Morgan University, right? Um, and that's a rich history there. Uh, Thurgood, I mean, uh, Frederick Douglass sang in the choir at Sharp Street United Methodist Church. Uh, at Bethel AME uh, Church, right there on Druid Hill Avenue, you had uh, something called the Young, the Citywide Young People's Forum. Uh, that was the Youth Council, right? The precursor of the Youth Council, and just imagine trying to get our young people in this day and age to come to a mass meeting on a Friday night, you know, it'd be a challenge. But back then, you know, my grandmother Juanita Mitchell and others organized this youth council and they met every Friday night uh, at Bethel for this young citywide young people's forum. And it was packed with hundreds of folks in there and they heard uh, lectures from national luminaries in the civil rights movement and they heard you know, music, and, and they heard preachers talking about, you know, the, the, the word and everything like that. But that really got the organization of the NAACP and all these other groups to get them all rallying together to get out, to, to start forming these protests and making change. And the young city, you know, Bethel was the breeding ground for all this uh, education piece uh, to inform our folks you know, this is what's happening around the country, and this is how you need to organize and, and go about making that change. And that we can't leave out Union. Um, and Baptist, Union Baptist, Union all right Baptist. there in Druid Hill Baptist. Avenue, correct. And, the, and, the, and, and anybody who, who wants to know about Baltimore um, history as it pertains to Black folks, you have to talk about Druid Hill uh, Avenue um, because it goes there. That's where it begins. Um, That's right. And so uh, uh, that's extremely important. And that's, that was all in your district. So as a young man growing up with all of this, the only thing you could think to do was to run for public office. That's it. Actually, you know, you, you mentioned my dad, who was a physician. I originally uh, thought I would be like him as a doctor. My father was a uh, gastroenterologist. Uh, he was one of the few African-American physicians that practiced the specialty of gastroenterology in Baltimore. He practiced for 47 years uh, here. Um, he was a graduate of Lincoln University undergrad, and then he went to Meharry Medical College in Nashville. Uh, he met my mother, who was at Fisk at the time. They came back to Baltimore. Uh, so he started practicing. And, you know, what was so good, you know, talk about how, like, this sort of public service was instilled in our family, no matter, you know, you didn't have to be a politician, you didn't have to be a lawyer or doctor, but, you know, it was sort of set into our thinking and our psyche that, you know, whatever you do, make sure you give back to your community. Uh, and my great grandmother, Lily Jackson said, service to your people is the rent you pay for your space on this earth. So here's my dad, he's a physician, he was uh, in training at Hopkins. He was at uh, he did his residency at the uh, at, at Greater Baltimore Medical Center, the first African American to be on staff there at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. Uh, but he kept his practice uh, 
in the 1200 block of Druid Hill Avenue. So while all the other doctors in the area, West Baltimore, start moving out into the greener pastures of Towson and uh, out into the county where there was a lot more, uh, there were so-called, what they would say, more quality patients and more money. My father kept his office right there in a 1200 block of Druid Hill Avenue, one block up from where he was born. So he stayed in the community with all the changes happening there. Uh, and he did not turn away any patients. Uh, when somebody just walked in his store, I know, and I remember as a kid, uh, sitting in his office and someone walked in with a stab wound. There was a big fight outside and walked in. Uh, and here's my father, a specialist in gastroenterology, looking for out for this, uh, uh, this person who came in with the stab wound and everything like that. So he was basically a pillar of the community, but that's an example of, you know, just staying within your community. And you always believe if you give back to your community, it will come back tenfold. Uh, and just the outpouring of support that he always had there uh, was tremendous. Well, I do remember when um, you were on the council. So you go on and run and win. I heard the story. I heard you tell the story that when you um, decided to run, you had these plans to have this uh, red, white, and blue signs and all this kind oh, of stuff. Oh, yeah, exactly. And they Which, told you, nope. <laughs> they, said, they, they said no. So... You know, with my other uncles, Clarence and Michael, you know, the, the Mitchell campaign colors were day glow orange and black, uh, not the, regular what's orange. The background on the orange? It was a, it was a background orange with black letters. And uh, you had these campaign signs. And I said, well, I'm jumping out. I'm new. I'm 28. I'm going to run for city council. And I brought back the proof of, uh, the signs and the bumper stickers, they looked at me like I had lost my mind. Uh, I remember my Uncle Clarence ripping up the proof and saying, you did the day glow orange and black. Uh, and I said, well, I'm trying to do what I want to do. And they insisted that you use that uh, day glow orange and black. And they were right. Those were, you know, there's a certain brand of campaign signs. It's like an advertising that people recognize you know, you may not see the name, but if you see the day glow orange and black, uh, that must be a Mitchell sign. Somebody, one of the Mitchells are running uh, for office. So we, we stuck with that. And, I, <laughs> and so you got elected two times. And now the um, one thing. So I, I got elected in 95 on a city council and I served three terms uh, representing the, back then the fourth district uh, in Baltimore. Um in my district, it was uh, the, the, back then. It wasn't single member districts; it was three person council manic districts. So, in the fourth district, it was me, uh, Sheila Dixon, and uh, Agnes Welsh. Uh, and so, we were a great team working together. And it was a lot of, you know, I would say it was a lot rewarding because we we're able to. The districts were bigger, extended all the way out into Winans Way, and also. Uh, in terms of uh, Winings Way, uh, Edmondson Village, and then snuck all the way down into uh, downtown Baltimore, where the University of Maryland medical systems are is, and then all the way up into Druid Hill Park, and also the other piece of uh, Druid Hill Park and um, uh, Druid Hill Park and Hamden. Uh, so we were able to tag team a large district, and so I served uh, twelve years. Uh, on the Baltimore City Council. And then in 2007, I decided I had enough. I sort of like hit that ceiling uh, in the City Council and I decided to take a shot and it was either up or out and I ran for mayor. Uh, I was not successful, but uh, the mayor's campaign really got me to see the entire city uh, instead of just my councilmanic district. And I saw all the different issues happening in our city uh, and didn't realize, uh, realize back then how big our city is, even though people say, well, Baltimore is a small town, you know, the, okay. the issues and the diversity is just incredible as you go around different neighborhoods and, and talk to folks. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I'm reminded of that every time I drive up on 95 and look at that. And I'm like, I, my first, my heart goes out to Brandon when I look at it. It's like, he's right. got to deal with all of that. Um, <laughs> 
but then you came back now uh, to run for delegate. So, yep. Yeah. So I, I, I lost that race. I went into the private sector. I went into banking. I was a small business well, you banker. Did, you did one term as delegate, though. I did a one term as delegate. So from uh, 2000, I got elected in 2010. Uh, so through 2011 through 2000 to 2015, uh, I served in the Maryland House of Delegates, uh, representing uh, West Baltimore in the uh, 44th district. Uh, and uh, I did one term of that. And then what happened was there was redistricting, unfortunately. And uh, our district was the only district where they put all three incumbents into one district for one seat. So I didn't make it uh, in there, but it was one of the best things that probably could have happened to me. Because, <laughs> so, uh, so you said thank you. Right. I, I didn't I didn't make it. And then uh, obviously you're disappointed that you're not going back. But, you know, a few weeks later, uh, that's when Governor Hogan had just got elected uh, in November and he had reached out to me. I met him once. I uh, didn't know a lot about him, but he reached out and asked if I would be interested in helping him. He was trying to build a bipartisan uh, team in his office in the governor's office and uh, was wondering if I would be interested in helping him out in his legislative office uh, so that uh, he had at least a Democrat in there just to be able to work uh, the majority, the Democratic majority legislature. And uh, so let me get this right. It was no political deal. None of that. He just called you up. Didn't know you from a can of paint. Did not. Uh, did, he he met me once. Uh, he knew my cousin C four, Clarence, because uh, they both worked for Earl Governor Ehrlich uh, when Governor Ehrlich administration, and then uh, Governor Hogan, at that time under Ehrlich was the appointments uh, secretary. Uh, so they had a relationship, but no, it wasn't any political deal or anything like that. In fact, I was teaching. I was a uh, I was up at, uh, I was teaching um, middle school and high school and doing admissions, um, uh, admissions work at a school uh, up in North Baltimore. And they reached out uh, at St. Paul School and they reached reached out to me and asked if I would be interested. Uh, and, wow. and, and so, you know, I went and met with the governor, uh, talked to him and uh, it was about two weeks before he was sworn in. Uh, laid out all the parameters, and then I came on board as a, uh, a special advisor to the governor uh, back in 2015. And this was the first term? This was the first term, his first term. Uh, and so I was with Governor Hogan for seven and a half years. Um, he gets termed out in January. I left his office in June of this year. Uh, but, you know, you talk about, you know, seeing things up front. Uh, in terms of from the executive branch, it is a very unique perspective that you get. I was a legislator, always in the legislative branch. So you sort of see how the sausage is made. You know, you're making bills, you're passing a budget and things like that. At the executive level, you're making real time decisions. Uh, and some of it is on the fly. Uh, you try to get as much information as you can, but you know, the governor at the end of the day makes the call. Uh, and, you know, we went through the unrest in Baltimore with Freddie Gray. Uh, we went through his cancer diagnosis uh, that he that he had. We went through a, a pandemic of the coronavirus uh, when there before there was vaccines and no one really knew what was happening. And there was a shutdown of schools and businesses. Uh, so you see you know, you get a full appreciation of the executive branch uh, in terms of all the issues that are like laid out up there. So it was a wonderful experience that I had. Uh, so tell, that, us about, tell us about the governor. Uh, a lot of people you know, don't know him. Uh, you know, it's, you know, people, you know, unfortunately, in this day and age of politics, you know, everybody is it's so polarizing that if you're a Republican, you're automatically labeled as a racist, uh, cold-hearted, just all about the rich folks. If you're a Democrat, you're labeled as a socialist, 
Uh, you get labeled as, you know, you're just a bleeding heart liberal or anything like that. Governor Hogan uh, was a, is a Republican. He's a conservative Republican. But, you know, people, I'm not anymore, but people were amazed at the way, uh, at how popular he is. Uh, you know, he's going into his second term. He's in the middle of his second term. He still has a high approval rating across the board uh, with blacks, white, Democrats, and Republicans. Now there's a small group of folks that would sit there and say, oh, he didn't do anything. Is that, that's, you know, that's part of our politics. But at the end of the day, you know, he is probably one of the few uh, politicians that I know that really knows, it had a sense of not just the messaging, but had a real gut uh, in terms of actions. He's very decisive in terms of his actions. Um, he's not afraid to mix it up. You know, during the Freddie Gray unrest, you know, he, we were in Baltimore and he was asking, okay, well, where do we go? And I said, let's just get out in the street. People need to see their leader. People need to touch the leader. Uh, he went to the Gilmore Homes on that first day. He went to Pennsylvania Avenue and North Avenue and talked to the folks there. Uh, and on that first day of that unrest, you know, people came up and hugged them. Uh, they said, thank you. Thank you for bringing the National Guard. Thank you for trying to bring order here. Um, and these were black shopkeepers. There was Iman uh, in West Baltimore that came up and prayed with him and said, thank you. Um, and we walked Pennsylvania Avenue. We walked Gilmore Homes, uh, went into East Baltimore, went in like downtown all over. And people, there was a genuine feeling of goodwill of uh, folks uh, for this governor. And, you know, and I think that's a testament to, you know, who he is. He, he grew up in Prince George's County. His father was the Prince George's County executive and a former uh, United States congressman. So he sort of has that common touch of, uh, you know, dealing uh, with people. To this day, you'll see him going to uh, uh, at, a, at a Ravens game or at a uh, Oriole baseball game, and he'll stand there and pause to take pictures. He's not just blowing through the crowd to get up to his seats or anything like that, but he wants to engage with all walks uh, of life of people. So it was it was very interesting. So you got the, um, I mean, you got about more experience than anybody could have. Um, you know, this is grassroots council stuff. You were the, the what they call the uh, the ward boss. <laughs> and then you became a legislator and then you go to the governor's mansion and where are we now? I don't think people know um, how this story has continued. So sure. So I'm in uh so I left the governor's office in June of this year after seven and a half years. Uh, and what I am doing now, I'm the vice president of the BGR group uh, and on their state and local advocacy division. Uh, the BGR group is a uh, lobbying firm uh, based in uh, Washington, D.C., with offices in London and in Austin, Texas. The uh, BGR group was founded by the former governor of Mississippi, Haley Barber, uh, and it is a bipartisan uh, lobbying firm uh, that we do federal relations and also state and local government relations. So it's about 42 to 45 lobbyists uh, in the uh, firm. And uh, we handle uh, everything from clients such as Microsoft and Accenture to uh, colleges and universities dealing with federal relations and also state uh, and local government. So, and, uh, so I go down to DC every day uh, I take the Mark train, so I, I get on that Mark train, and I'm now a big fan of mass transit. I think the Mark train is fantastic. Oh, oh you want you want the red line now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I voted for the red line. You know, I was one of the few in that administration that said, "Hey, we should do this," but <laughs> I'm uh, not the governor. But uh, uh, the thing is, this is a this is a return for the Mitchells to Capitol Hill. Now, we we talked a lot about <laughs> your, your grandmother and your great grandmother. But we didn't talk about your grandfather. Sure. So my grandfather was Clarence Mitchell Jr. Uh, the courthouse uh, downtown, the circuit courthouse, is named for him. Now he was uh, never he was never in elected office, right? 
never elected office. In fact, a lot of people think, oh, the Mitchells are all Democrats. You know, they're all that. No, my grandfather was a registered independent. The reason he was in the registered independent, because he was the uh, director of the Washington Bureau of the NAACP, which is the lobbyist, government relations lobbyist for the NAACP in Washington. Uh, and when he went on Capitol Hill to meet with senators and Congress folks, he wanted to make sure that he wasn't seen as a partisan. So he was a registered uh, independent. Now, if you want to go way back in history in the 30s, he actually ran for the House of Delegates uh, soon out of college as a uh, socialist ticket on the socialist ticket. Uh, he was not successful, but uh, as he got into D.C., he was a registered independent. Uh, and like I said, he was the lobbyist for the NAACP and his uh, his legacy is in every single civil rights bill that you see uh, in, in Washington, D.C., the, the 57 Civil Rights Act, 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, all those pieces of legislation uh, had his stamp on it. Uh, in terms of working the halls of Congress. He, he, you know, it was funny, you know, there was always debate about what is more effective, you know, getting out in the street, protesting, making sure, changing the conscience of folks or working the halls. He always believed that, you know, you, you can get out in the street and protest. That's an effective uh, method, but that's not the only method. You have to get in and talk to the legislators to get the laws changed. Uh, and he believed in law. There were some folks, particularly presidents, that say, well, how about we put an executive order in? Well, when the next president comes in, they can wipe away that executive order. He believed in uh, the foundation of the law uh, at the legislative branch and also uh, at the court. And when he was at NAACP, he traveled all over the country whenever the big bill, Civil Rights Act, was coming up or the Voting Rights Act. Uh, he would go to all the local branches uh, in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, uh, and here he was coming in, uh, and he had the voting records of all of the local congressmen and senators of those states. Uh, and it was very meticulous in terms of the detail that, for instance, if it was a senator or if it was a congressman from Covington, Georgia, or, or Thomasville, Georgia, he had their voting records in terms of the voting rights, uh, civil rights. So he wanted to educate members of the NAACP. Here's how your congressman is voting and here's why you got to change and, and vote a different way. So very effective. He traveled all over the country uh, for that. He did that for over 30 uh, plus years uh, at the NAACP. And so do you think anybody saw this happening for you that you would be the, the lobbyist? Uh, in Annapolis? No, I, you know what? In, in Washington, D.C. Let's get that right. I, I, I had no idea. And it's funny. My dad used to say sometimes windows of opportunity open up so much. And, uh, you know, I'm always a firm believer that God puts things in front of you uh, and to do things. And, you know, you can't see, you know, when I lost the mayor's race, you know, I had two young kids. I was like, oh, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to find a job. I swore off politics. I'm not doing this again. I had enough. Uh, but then God puts something in front of you, an opportunity. You look at it, uh, but God won't allow you to uh, sit there and mull it over for a few weeks. God's going to force you to make it make a decision. Uh, and never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that. Uh, I would be sitting in the governor's office at the state house as his chief legislative officer, nor as his acting chief of staff uh, at one point for a Republican governor. And a lot of people fall out like, oh, well, Kiefer's a Republican. No, I'm still a Democrat. Been a Democrat since 1986. Still on the books as a Democrat. Vote every election. So um, I, I would actually challenge uh, my legislative friends, when I first started working for Governor Hogan, who they were calling me a turncoat or traitor, <laughs> I said, uh, "Go check my voting record. I'm still a Democrat, and still I there. still give. I still, I still donate to your campaign, so I can't be that bad. You still right. cash my check well, you, uh, for your donation. All, they go, they'll take all your checks now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, man, it's been fun. I um, 
I want to, uh, again, congratulate you. Like I said, I don't think, you know, there's not a, probably another person who has the wealth of, of experience that you have just put on display in this interview um, in a lifetime. Some people don't, right. you know, they don't do but one thing, uh, <laughs> one thing good. Um, but uh, the reality so, is that you have made it happen at every level. Um, and it's, um, it's very exciting to know that you're going to continue it in some way. Um, certainly you can call on us because um, we're going to call on you. Exactly. And, uh, make sure that this thing is uh, continues because the city needs help. I'm sitting right, right. here in uh, my office in Park Heights. And I was sitting here about this time the other day. Uh, I think it was Wednesday. And I started getting these calls about a shooting. People were saying, yeah. are you all right? <laughs> exactly. And it turns out that right two blocks down the street from me, um, and this is a location where um, we did the Baltimore Road Race was the 5K that my organization, the Park Heights Community Health Alliance, um, hosted for seven or eight years. And we started at Shirley because there's a beautiful monument there, a uh, mural there that I wanted people to see at the start. And, you know, when you when you go up Park Heights Avenue, you see all these old synagogues that are now black churches. You can see this, that and the other. Um, um, and then you see the racetrack. You can see all this stuff. But in that location, we had done work to beautify because we knew the race was going to start there. Um, but um, but somebody got killed there. You know, yep. so I got killed there. Several other people were shot there. And it was in the middle of the day. All and right. all we did is um, hand wringing from um, from leaders. Uh, the police, the, the police commission was the first person on the scene. And his response to it was um, call the person a coward, which I guess that's a good thing to say. I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> coward, a cowardly murderer. A domestic terrorist that's other words than coward <laughs> All right. and, then, and then he says then he says call call the police tell on them go tell you know and that's the policy that we have so that's 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 heartbreaking to me that well, i just um, want to i just want to say will uh, before we end is that you know incidents like that and what's happening in our city but more importantly what's happening in our country in the terms of this divide uh, to me illustrates the fact that we need the NAACP we need right. the NAACP to uh, you know continue to advocate and agitate uh because you know it's organizations just like this you know politicians can't do it on their own the right. police can't do it on their own the school system can't do it on their own but you know, with your leadership and, and the fact that you are trying to organize young people to get them involved, you know, sometimes I get frustrated when I talk to young folks and I say, hey, have you joined the NAACP? And they're like, ah, those are for a bunch of old people. That's not the case. Uh, you know, and, and you're doing a fantastic job and the state branch is doing a great job. I know you and I always debated when I was in the governor's office and Busting and fighting or whatever, but it was all out of love for both well, of us. You, you always, you always welcome me in. So exactly, um, always, I, I always return the phone call. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Regardless of the time of the day, night, or whatever. Exactly. Like so, um, and that's what. But you keep are, doing so. what you keep doing and what you're doing. You're standing on the shoulders of my grandparents and members of my family, and and they're smiling down, saying, "Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing okay." All right, man. I want to thank you. Um, good luck in um, in DC. The Beltway thank is the Beltway. But, that's um, right. It's uh, in the swamp. You can you can win, man. You can win. So thanks a lot. Take care. Good luck. All right. Thank peace, you. man. Peace, peace to you. Peace.